We'll see. Okay. Yes, we're heading to Michael. So now, um, Kayla, if you're able to unmute Michael, I'm going to let him um, give us some Heart Pride updates. Michael, you are unmuted. Michael, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. So first off, I want to thank everyone for joining us um, at, at this hour, at this time. Um, I do feel like we are at a very um, uh, difficult uh, time for um, um, uh, folks that work in parks and green space. This is a time where we're encouraging, um, um, if anything, we're looking at both um, as this um, issue has developed when it first started. Michael, your audio. You've been looking. What's that? You cut out for a second. Oh. Um, go back now? to difficult time. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think we're at a very difficult time for those that work on parks and green space issues. And I feel like um, we've had to evolve and change our messaging um, as the intensity of these issues have escalated. Oh, great. Yeah. And so participants if you're not muted if you could um put yep. yourself on mute if you're on the phone that's star six so i'll just keep um keep going that i think that we are at an interesting place where our messaging has evolved from initially really focusing on encouraging folks to use their parks and to leverage the opportunities that they afford uh, to really more of a focus on erring on the side of caution and encouraging folks to practice social distancing, um, but also given the fact that we see in some cases that uh, people are not observing uh, the need to keep uh, separate, um, um, really encouraging folks to take the uh, shelter in place um, um, guidelines seriously and encouraging people to experience nature out their window in their backyard on their neighborhood street and only to go to your local neighborhood park under certain conditions. Um, and um, with that in mind, I feel like we um, have found ourselves um, wanting to make sure that uh, from a community facing standpoint that we're asking for people to spread the word um, about the need to um, err on the side of caution and uh, not to be playing on playgrounds and other surfaces. Um, I am seeing that there is seems to be more um, attention to the guidelines that are being put out there, uh, but still see plenty of different examples uh, where people are um, um, not taking this as seriously as they should. Um, so this has been, um, uh, you know, as we've been working at Park Pride, we've been working remotely um, and continuing to use things like uh, Microsoft Teams as well as Zoom to keep connected with folks. Um, and I feel like we're doing a decent job of anticipating the issues as we're moving forward. Um, I'll also mention that Park Pride as a nonprofit organization has been facing a lot of the um, financial implications that are coming up uh, with um, the economic impact. So very closely we're engaged on efforts related to the CARES Act um, and the relief that's being provided for small businesses and nonprofits um, and are looking at that as a sign of relief that uh, we are hopeful will be helping us in our efforts um, as we're um, moving forward in 2020. All right, thank you, Michael. Is that all mm -hmm. from you for now? Um, I'll just, I, I, the only other thing that I will add is that um, as we go through the conversation, I really appreciate Brian Borden being here from City of Brookhaven. I uh, appreciate Rob Brauner being here from the Atlanta Beltline Partnership, and I would love for them to have a chance to share a little bit about how they're responding in the respective areas. Um, and I will provide uh, some uh, additional input from what I'm hearing from the city of Atlanta, uh, but also um, um, I'm here to answer questions. I did mention, I will mention that on the chat function, I posted a supporter report column 
uh, that's entitled, Should You Be Visiting Your Local Park? Uh, that I think has some, some good guidance and some helpful links um, that um, I think would be helpful to folks that are on this call. So I would encourage folks to check that out. And if you don't have access to the chat function, if you go to supportareport.com, um, you will find a column there under the People, Places, Parks section uh, that's entitled, Should You Be Visiting Your Local Park? Uh, that's an article that um, I've posted with the help of Rachel Marr uh, that provides our, our best thinking and guidance at this particular stage. So appreciate you again being here and uh, being part of this call. Thank you, Michael. Um, and now I'd love to hear from Brian Borden, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Brookhaven. Yeah. All right, there we go. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, thank you, Michael, for having us. Uh, in the city of Brookhaven, you know, we've, we've kind of, we were kind of the, taking the lead in this from the very beginning. Our mayor, uh, our council was very proactive. Uh, we closed all of our recreation centers and playgrounds uh, starting on March the 12th. Uh, as we've gone on, we've included to shut down all of our dog parks, uh, all of our outdoor restrooms, all of our athletic fields, uh, outdoor basketball courts, tennis courts. Everything has been completely shut down in order to try to keep people from social gathering uh, and to help limit the spread of the COVID-19. Uh, we're still, we still left open our trails and our new Peachtree Creek Greenway. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of activity on our trails uh, and on the Greenway. We are continuing as part of our message to our citizens is to continue to practice social distancing. Uh, we've actually got some signs we'll be putting out along all of our trail entrances tomorrow uh, that encourage people to continue to social distance. Uh, from, and also from Brookhaven standpoint, we've also worked with um, I had a company come in and do deep cleaning on all of our parks and recreation facilities uh, to include our outdoor restrooms, some of our baseball facilities, all of our recreation centers. So uh, that's kind of where we are at this point with the city of Brookhaven. Uh, right now, we're still under the shelter in place through the 15th through our orders, uh, as well as the governor's orders that were extended out to uh, the 13th of May uh, just this afternoon. So. From a standpoint of in Brookhaven, we're, we're seeing a lot of people obey this, staying in, but we're also seeing a lot of people now out walking, getting, out, getting the exercise, getting out of the house uh, for, to help with their mental sanity at this point, uh, coming out and using our parks. So. Thank you, Brian, that's great news. Um, and if there are any questions for Brian about Brookhaven or anything that he just mentioned, um, please feel free to ask those. If you're on the phone and you want to ask a question, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Um, and again, star six mutes and unmutes you. And if you press star nine, again, that will unraise your hand. Um, if, you know, if somebody asks your question and it gets answered, you can lower your hand. So any questions um, for Brian about Brookhaven, put them in the chat. Or if you're on the phone, raise your hand using star nine. All right, I'm gonna give We're it good. a Yeah, I think so. Okay, well, thank you so much, Brian. Um, and if, um, if anyone does have questions for you or um, wants to kind of follow what's going on in Brookhaven, what is the best way for them to do that? Uh, the best way for people to continue to follow what we're doing in Brookhaven is go to our city website, www.brookhavenga.gov. Wonderful, thank you very much. All right, um, so now I wanna welcome Rob Bronner, Executive Director of the Elena Bella Partnership to give his update. Great. Thank you, Alan, I appreciate that. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, because first of all, I just, just wanna say thank, uh, thank you and, and be safe, um, absolutely safety and, and social distancing and, and staying inside as much as possible is, is uh, critical at, at this time. Um, I'm frankly would echo a lot of the things that uh, Michael said, um, and, and I'll speak for, I'm going to kind of wear two hats here, both as executive director of the Beltline Partnership, and then uh, Clyde Higgs, who's the CEO of Atlanta Beltline Inc., uh, regrets he, that he could not uh, participate today, but 
he and I have been on enough calls together that I can kind of channel um, a lot of, of uh, what Atlanta Beltline Inc. is doing. Um, and, and actually they had a board meeting this morning and, and provided some updates on trail usage, which I will, which I will share as well. Um, we had both organizations have been working remotely uh, since March 13th. So we're, I guess, in the fourth week now of uh, working, working remotely. Um, the Beltline Partnership, for our standpoint, um, we have suspended all, all programming. Um, that, it, that includes the Adopt the Beltline program with Park Pride, although I know we've uh, continued to, to work together to figure out how we can uh, plan to, to get back out there when, when it's safe again. Um, we are uh, trying to figure out how many of our you know, programs where we can uh, do them virtually. So uh, one of those that's, that's really important to us, uh, not directly parks related, but we have a series of home empowerment workshops that are uh, geared towards helping uh, residents in Beltline neighborhoods connect with the programs and partners and resources that can help them to stay in their homes. Um, and, and certainly during this time and in, in the ec economic challenges, I think that's probably more important than ever. And, and so we have our next one coming up on April 18th and we will be doing that uh, virtually. So that may actually be something that we can uh, learn from and, and make part of our, the way we deliver that uh, programming going forward. Um, also uh, trying to you know, figure out how can we do volunteer training and, and other things online so that we can hit the ground running when we um, start up again. Um, we've been fortunate at the Beltline Partnership that we have not had um, anybody on our team of seven uh, diagnosed with COVID at Atlanta Beltline Inc. Uh, they actually have had uh, one employee uh, who was uh, diagnosed with, with COVID. Um, fortunately, uh, that employee has, um, is, 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 doing very, is doing well now, uh, fever's broken, um, and, and they're, they're recovering. Uh, but the uh, virus certainly did hit close to home on, on our team. Um, like, like Michael said, uh, we are also, um, you know, have, have our application into the, uh, paycheck protection program as, as part of the SBA small business, um, recovery and, and working with our bank to, to move that, to move that forward. But, um, you know, we're, we're kind of all, all in this together. I mean, I, I would say, uh, top line that, you know, certainly there are, are many organizations who are working, very hard right now to to address the immediate crisis, and, and they all need our support. Um, we are continuing to to work kind of behind the scenes because you know we believe very strongly that the uh, Beltline is going to be a critical piece of the recovery um, once we get through the the health crisis. Uh, that from an economic standpoint, uh, from a, a mental and, and physical health standpoint, from just really the need for residents to connect. Um, that, that the Beltline, you know, that can play a perhaps more important role than ever in the city's healing uh, once we once we get through the immediate immediate health crisis. In the meantime, though, we are very much trying to have people stay off of the Beltline um, and and adhere to social distancing. Um, for those, you know, you may have seen comments on on social media. There has been a um, you know a, a vocal. Uh, group that that has been pushing to close the Beltline, um, the the city and and the mayor and and Atlanta Beltline Inc. taking the advice of um, you know leading health experts uh, like Dr. Del Rio at, at Emory University and and Sanjay Gupta and others who you know have really said quote, quote, the Beltline is very important during this time for uh, mental health, physical health, and um, as a transportation corridor. And that absolutely people need to adhere to social distancing and be safe. And, and um, just being honest, that wasn't uh, the case. People were not behaving um, as, as seriously as we needed uh, them to at the beginning. Um, the good news is that um, in, in part because of a pretty aggressive campaign with signage, um, with media interviews, with um, you know social media, and even now there's there are electronic signs that uh, Atlanta Beltline Inc is partnering with GDOT. So the same types of signs that you see when you're you know road construction um, or or uh, other types of hazardous 
um, areas or, or public notice. Those are on the Beltline now, and, and they are reporting the number of uh, COVID-related deaths and, and cases kind of real time, making sure that people understand uh, just how, how serious this is. Um, there are uh, new uh, guidelines that um, have been uh, put out that Mayor Bottoms announced yesterday. I put a link uh, to them in the, in the chat, but um, I'll, I will save them for folks who, who may not be able to see them. I mean, one of the things that Atlanta Beltline Inc. Has, has been doing, they do have counters on the trail and they're, they're really trying to follow the, the data. Um, and uh, one of the things that the data has, has shown um, has been a uh, substantial reduction um, in, in traffic. So on weekends, uh, foot traffic is down 50% um, from um, pre, pre-COVID levels. Um, they've also looked at time of day. And, and so we know that you know, six to, you know, the early morning is, is one of the um, least traveled part of the days. And so we're really trying to prioritize that for um, if, if there are older adults or those with compromised health conditions who have to use the um, Beltline, that, that they try to schedule their trips um, in that, that 6 to 10 a.m. Um, section. Uh, the, you know, for exercising, the um, guidelines are 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and, and absolutely encouraging folks to maintain uh, safe distancing during that, during that period. And then after 2 p.m., um, really is focused only for people who need it uh, for um, transit-related needs. So if, if you need it to get to work, if you need it to get to the grocery store or medicine, um, you know, go to the pharmacy, uh, that's, who, that's who should be using it after 2 p.m. And, and everybody else, we're really encouraging to, um, you, if you have to get outside, use other parts of the city. There are lots of other trails, there are sidewalks, you know, spread out um, and, and be safe. Um, so that's the kind of you know, summary of, of where we are on, on the Beltline. Again, uh, we, if you look at the curves, um, weekend traffic is down substantially. Traffic overall is down uh, substantially. It, one of the interesting things when you, when you look at the, the shape of it is that it used to be, not surprisingly, that, that big spikes on the weekends and, and less traffic on during the week. And now it's, it's pretty flat across the board, which um, I think indicates that if you're, you, know, you don't have people coming to visit the Beltline on the weekends in, in the way that I think you used to. I, I, my unscientific assessment of that is that it's, it's mainly local traffic that, that needs it to, to get around. So happy to answer any questions, um, but that's, that's where things are with the Beltline. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Rob. Um, and I think what we'll do, if you have a question for Rob, um, we're gonna hold off until after Michael gives our City of Atlanta updates, and then we'll take questions for both of them. Um, so Michael, do you mind um, giving us an update from the City of Atlanta? Um, so, couple of things that I did want to cover. First off, I'm going to share um, a statement that they had, that the city of Atlanta had provided to us that I will, that I will both read as well as share in the chat function that kind of shares their kind of the, their um, um, overarching message, which is um, our local parks, trails, and open spaces have always served as places uh, to find respite, seek peace and re restoration. And these places are needed now more than ever before. Mental health has been flagged as a top health concern associated with the COVID-19 outbreak by the CDC. Parks, trails, and open, open green spaces provide the opportunity to be among nature and the outdoors while allowing the chance to remain physically active, uh, shown to help reduce stress. Um, it is, however, equally important that residents use and enjoy our city parks and trails safely and responsibly. Slowing the spread of COVID-19 remains the number one priority. And so residents must understand that in order to continue enjoying our parks and trails, they must abide by the guidelines of social distancing. So while our parks, trails, and even golf courses, golf courses, green spaces are open to the public, we cannot emphasize enough that staying six feet apart 
refraining from group activities and gatherings and following CDC guidelines will help ensure that these spaces can continue being enjoyed by so many who depend upon them. Um, a couple of other things that I will add. Uh, one is in the message we got from the city, they shared that there is a website that's been set up to help local residents uh, check for information from the city of Atlanta that they're putting out in response to COVID-19. And that website, which I will put up on the chat, is www.atlstrong.org. And um, I, um, I went to that site earlier today, and it does have a way of signing up for text messages um, from the city on COVID-19, which was fairly simple to do and puts you on a list to receive alerts. So I would encourage folks to check that out. Um, in addition, I will mention that there's a number of other things that I've been seeing going on on um, uh, parks and green spaces within the city of Atlanta. We did hear from our friends at Chastain and Chastain Golf Course that that's been open for public access for people to walk um, and to use the park, um, use the golf course more for um, walkers and people to use that open space, which I think has been a, a great short-term option of giving people open space that allows them to maintain social distance. I've heard similar reports from Candler Park. Um, I also know that one of the biggest challenges that we have seen have been um, people on playgrounds as well as basketball courts and other places using the facilities despite the signage that tells them that they are closed. Um, there are signage, about a thousand signs that have been put out at uh, parks all throughout the city of Atlanta, in addition to signage telling people about the fact that the playgrounds um, and um, other recreational equipment are closed. I have seen that there is caution tape that has come up in some cases around the different playgrounds. In many cases, those have been citizens going and putting those out there for an added measure um, of attention. And recently, and I don't know how widespread this is, but I did get a message from the Grant Park Conservancy sharing that the basketball rims had been removed um, and had heard some talk of that happening in a more uh, widespread fashion, uh, but um, not working for the city of Atlanta. I don't, I don't know uh, whether or not that that's the case or not, but have seen some of the, the responsiveness on that point that's going beyond uh, telling people what to do, but also actually taking additional measures to make sure uh, that people are uh, practicing the right kinds of behaviors. So um, I think that's what I've got in terms of anything that I've gotten from the city of Atlanta. I would encourage folks to check out that uh, www.atlstrong.org. Um, it also mentions a, a United Way fund that's looking at ways of providing uh, support for um, efforts that are related to uh, COVID-19 response. Uh, that's part of this whole campaign, and I expect that we'll be hearing more about that in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, so now, if mm -hmm. we're ready, I think we can open it up to questions for Rob and Michael. Um, I did see one that already came up for Rob um, in the chat. So again, if you're on the computer online, um, please put your questions in the chat. If you're on the phone and you have a question, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, so this first one was from Brian for Rob. Can you repeat those um, time frames for the different groups of people and different activities that are suggested for the bell yep. line? Yes, and and also just uh, for the for the reference, if you go to bellline.org um, and there's a COVID-19 how's the bell line responding link on the homepage um, that's also in the chat. But the uh, hours are uh, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. is prior, It's the prioritized time period for older adults and those with compromised health conditions. So that's 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. is when, uh, if, you, if you need to use the belt line for your, your daily exercise, um, of course, you need to practice safe distancing while you do that. Um, that's between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Uh, but we really are trying to, um, you know, in, encourage people to use other trails. If, if the Beltline's your only option, it's it's there for you. But if if you have other options, we would prefer that you not use the Beltline. Um, and then after 2 p.m., it really is for uh, trans. If you if you need the Beltline as a transportation corridor, um, so that's to get to work. That's to go get. Uh, groceries to get to the pharmacy um, that 
you know, after 2 p.m. that there's really that really should be the only group that's using uh, the Beltline in the in the afternoon. Um, everybody else, we really really need them to to stay off and and either find other options or um, well, we need to find other options. So Ellen, I've noticed that Audriana had her hand raised. Is that intentional, Audriana? Were you trying to ask a question? No, it was not. I don't know why that happened. I'm sorry. No worries. I <laughs> will remute you. Um, I also noticed that a uh, phone number had raised their hand um, and that is ending in 0226. So I'm not sure if they were trying to ask a question as well. This is the um, your unmuted uh, phone number that ends in 0226. Did you have a question? Okay, I'm gonna assume that that was incorrect. So I will remute them and Ellen, you can continue. Okay, um, so there was actually another hand raise on the phone. Uh, the number's ending in 5389. You're yes. now unmuted. Uh, this, this is Pauline Drake. Mike, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My question, my question relates to something that Michael and another speaker mentioned, and that's the opportunity for getting, I think, grants from the Small Business Administration. I wanted to be, wanted to ask him to tell more about that and how those funds would be used and how soon he would expect to, to know whether such a grant would be made available. Michael, do you want to sure, be, better? Why, why don't I start? And I will say that I have a little bit of tunnel vision in the way that I've been approaching this because part of the quick learning curve has been how it relates to Park Pride, um, but also recognizing that there are a wider range of, um, of small businesses and nonprofits that are impacted. Uh, but the CARES Act actually set up um, a measure to look at the um, uh, ways that the, the uh, impacts of COVID-19 are um, um, negatively impacting small businesses and nonprofits across the U.S. The US. So there's a care package that was set up and a process that has been very quickly outlined by the Small Business Administration. And so this is a federal uh, program that um, is um, essentially a loan program um, that allows um, uh, com small businesses and nonprofits to essentially apply for a loan that is equal to two and a half times your salary plus benefits um, through payroll um, and having um, a whole um, series of different um, um, uh, requirements and guidelines that need to be followed in order to both submit for the loan and then under certain conditions where you're adhering to certain rules of keeping folks on the payroll, not um, eliminating staffing positions because of those budget cuts, uh, that that uh, loan is forgiven. And so um, the, the, that has been really where a lot of my attention has been. I also know that through the CARES Act, they're also providing uh, support for individuals in, for, in the form of uh, um, enhanced unemployment and benefits for people who um, are in a place where they're either reducing their work hours or um, in a furloughed capacity um, 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 that are actually providing some uh, relief as well. And while we're on the call, I will send um, a link for so, some more detailed information on the CARES Act and uh, more detail. Much of the information that we've gotten up to speed on has been coming through the Georgia Center for Nonprofits um, that from the point that this was actually working its way through Congress, to its implementation and just this past Friday was when they actually got to the point of actually kind of releasing the program um, and many of the banks um, came online and started providing an opportunity to submit uh, loan applications um, as of Friday. Some of the mainline banks didn't actually follow suit until the weekend, which is what we um, had found in terms of our experience. Um, but they're expecting this to move pretty quickly as in a couple of weeks uh, before uh, dollars are actually uh, groups. I know that we're right now working through the process ourselves 
um, uh, but expecting to have a fairly quick response on this. Um, and again, part of the impetus for this was looking at uh, the negative impact on the overall economy of um, um, non nonprofits and small businesses that were looking at the need to um, eliminate positions because of the inability to cover uh, the shortfall and looking at a relief package that was meant to address that issue and then benefits actually going towards individuals in the form of enhanced unemployment and um, other types of benefits along those lines. So is there anybody who would care to add from what I've shared already? Um, I'm sure I've had some gaps in my understanding, but that's what I know. No, that, Michael, that was a really, um, that was a really thorough, good overview. The, the pieces that I would maybe under, underscore, so the, the CARES Act just, uh, maybe, maybe everybody knows about it, but that, that's the $2 trillion uh, package that went through Congress uh, a little bit over a week ago. Um, for the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, which is the loan uh, program that Michael talked about, um, just to be clear, you, you apply for that through your bank. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are certain lenders who are um, approved by the Small Business Administration to give this type of loan. So if you haven't already, I highly encourage you to reach out to your bank, see if they qualify for that. Many of the banks are, are um, giving first priority and, and maybe at this point only priority to their existing customers. Um, so, so we definitely encourage you to reach out to your bank and there are multiple loan programs. Um, we at the Beltline Partnership are doing the same one that, that Michael spoke to, which is essentially helping the intent is to keep people employed. Um, and, and it's calculated, uh, based on your, uh, payroll costs and, and benefits. There are other programs. If you have a small business that, um, you know, maybe was directly impacted like, a um, you know, right, restaurant or something that, that there, there are other types of disaster loan funds that, um, that, you, that may be better suited to you. The Georgia Center for Nonprofits is a great resource. Um, I would say the Pro Bono Partnership um, is another one who has been publishing a lot of information for, um, for folks in Atlanta. Um, and then there, if you're not a nonprofit and, and uh, it's more of a small business thing, there are some things like, uh, for going or, or, or deferring uh, social security taxes and, and other things, but you kind of have to pick which of the programs works best for you based on your specific situation. Thank you. Um, Pauline, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Awesome. So I'm gonna actually go back to 0226 number, which is Catherine Spillman, and then we have a question from David in the chat. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to, to all of you that are on this call this evening. Uh, Rob, question for you, and also I have a comment, um, if you could indulge me. The first comment, uh, or the first, um, the first thing that I have is a question, and that is, to what extent does the Beltline work with the PATH Foundation on putting signage out? So we had reached out to Park Pride um, about signage needed on the Northwest Beltline corridor and was happy to see that signage um, go in. However, on the PATH Foundation connector trail that goes around the other part of Bobby Jones Golf Course, that section of the trail did not receive signage. Um, it, it could have changed in the last couple of days. I have not been on it in the last couple of days, but just have a question about that in terms of, you know, should I have actually reached out to the PATH Foundation about their policy regarding putting up signage, or are you working together, um, you know, if this unfortunately goes longer or we have another pandemic in the future, how are the two of those organizations, your organization with PATH, working together to make sure that all trail segments are covered? Yeah, um, let's see, so I'm, I'm gonna give you the best answer that I can, um, kind of acknowledging that uh, Atlanta Beltline Inc. Has, has been the one who has, um, you know, and I, I think they've been doing a great job on, on the signage, but um, and I'll, I will try to text them and get an answer after I give you this answer. And if I get it before the end of the call, I'll share it. 
Um, so what I can say about PATH is that, um, you know, PATH's PATH model generally is after they build a trail, it's, it's turned over to the um, local uh, governmental uh, municipality and that any mm -hmm. uh, signage on that is, is really um, done by whoever the municipality is. So PATH uh, generally does not have, um, as, as far as I know, kind of ongoing um, uh, uh, responsibility or ownership for things like signage on those on those trails and when i talked to uh, greta their new executive director last week and, and even was asking about like the silver comet trail and stuff it, it was you know her answer was well that depends on which county it's going through and what that county's done um so it, it's a it's a little bit different situation or quite a bit different situation than the beltline where um you know the beltline's still under construction atlanta beltline inc and the partnership are, are kind of actively um, uh, you know, players in the in the ongoing community and 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 everything, and partners with the city on that, um, and and therefore uh, have more of a direct role in in the type of response to a situation like this. Um, specifically, as it relates to the connector trail, I I can, and what kind of conversations ABI may have had with Path, I I'll, I will text to to try to get a specific answer on that around Bobby Jones Golf Course. Um, but I don't, I, I just told you what I know. So I hope, yeah, hope that's, that's helpful, Rob. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it might be something to, uh, Michael, you know, as, uh, maybe you're following up with Commissioner Gargle mentioned that there has been a, a bit of a gap there, um, that we need to think through, um, in future situations. Obviously people who are walking halfway around Bobby Jones golf course, when they see the signs, hopefully they'll comply to them, comply with them around the rest of the path. Um, but that is uh, something that I've seen. Um, one, one comment for you, Rob, and then I'll ask my uh, question um, to, to Michael. So I appreciate what you have done to try to limit the number of people that Unfortunately, I've not been following the rules on the Beltline. It's a great way for people to get out. I think it's a wonderful outlet because we all need it. Um, and I know that probably some signage has already gone up about the 10 to 2, you know, the early morning 10 to 2 and, and um, the transportation for later in the day. Mm -hmm. My question is, given um, the, the use, I, I understand really we're wanting to limit the use so that people don't not abide by the six foot distancing but when it comes to weekends and we know that people are going to be using the belt line to get out is there different signage have you thought about whether or not you change those times because obviously if it's a weekend you might have not nine to fivers working what what is what is the belt line yeah so so the the, the the change in hours, um, I mean, li literally happened within the past 24 to 48 hours. So uh, we haven't had a weekend yet with those um, with with those new hours. Uh, I do know that the I mean the signage has become um, progressively more um, in, insistent, stringent. It, it's you know orange and red now instead of blue and green, and the messages are very direct, like you know, if it's not an emergency, go home. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty direct. It's much more direct messaging than, than I think when we first started. Um, and the electronic signs, the, the, uh, G dot signs are going to be very visible. Um, you know, uh, marker sign, you know, calls to action on, on being safe. Um, I know that Atlanta Beltline Inc is checking the data daily in terms of uh, usage and has been responding uh, based on what those uh, traffic patterns, if you will, have, have shown. So what whatever happens this weekend, I know that they will have a uh, thoughtful response um, come Monday, but but certainly the, um, the signs, both electronic and printed, um, are, are a lot uh, more substantial. Uh, going into this weekend with the new with the new hours. Sure. And, and, and to that point, to the extent that uh, we can help 
any conservancies that have a belt line within their domain, if there is a way for you to create um, you know, an email list, we'd certainly be glad to forward information because a lot of people may not see um, the, the new guidelines or what have you. So to that, to that, we're happy to help. And I'm sure I speak from, from everybody on this call and, and people that are not on this call. So Rob, I appreciate all that, that everyone with that one is doing. Um, and I'll move my question over to, to, to Michael just to pass on, along to Commissioner Dargle. Um, to your point about the playgrounds, um, they have been, you know, when, when the decision was made to close the playgrounds and we went out and there was one paper sign that was put up um, and that, that paper sign still exists. We were one of the conservancies that of course went around and put caution tape out, added additional signage. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know from Commissioner Garble, not from you, Michael, because I, I don't think that you could answer this. What is the, the Parks Department's policy on going back by and visiting these playgrounds to ensure that if caution tape has been put up, it's not been written down or that the signage has not been taken? Because that's what we're seeing at Memorial Park, whether it's teenagers or who knows what other reason could happen. A lot of our efforts get undone over the days and then we, we try to get back as, as we can, but again, it's, it's challenging given um, the mandates that are out there right now. Mm -hmm. Am I unmuted? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so um, a couple of things. First off, I think the specific areas, like the area that you mentioned by Bobby Jones and for other folks that are aware on the call of if there are parks or trails that are lacking within the city of Atlanta that are lacking signage, if you can give me very specific details on those areas. I know that the Parks Department has put out about a thousand signs um, out into the different parks, all parks and trails all throughout uh, the city of Atlanta. And as a follow-up for this call, I would love to give them some ideas of places that are needing additional signs. And the, the message that I got from the Parks Department was a willingness to respond to those needs. Um, we have been doing weekly um, uh, Friends of the Park support calls that some of you have participated in that have happening every Friday from 12 to 1, where we've been listening to what we're hearing on the ground in neighborhoods all throughout our service areas. Um, and we have been hearing some of the things that have been happening with the uh, police, with the uh, caution tape that's up at the playground. That has not been something that the Parks Department has, has been, um, is a sanctioned activity. It's not something that they're doing to check. They're not, um, and for that matter, the one response I've gotten so far on this was that that was not um, um, something that they were that they were condoning. Um, but I have noticed that across uh, the parks that I've been visiting, that citizens have uh, put up caution tape to make sure that they're creating a very visual sense that the uh, playground is not available and. Um, I can also relay the concerns that you're raising over the fact that even that's not working, but even a commitment that that is something that's sanctioned is not something that I've seen um, from the Parks Department at this time. Um, back to the comment that was brought up in terms of what Rob shared in terms of path trails being the jur jurisdiction, not of path, but of the Parks Department, I do know that there are uh, maintenance obligations for all of the City of Atlanta trails by the City of Atlanta. And again, that's where I think on the trail, on the signage that we have seen, and what I'm talking about are the, the um, signs that say, do your part while in our parks, practice social distancing, and they're the blue and white signs that the Parks Department has put out. I think if there's examples of parks that don't have those, um, as well as trails, I think that there is some ability to respond to those. Um, so I, I, I don't know that that's um, exactly giving you the answer that you're looking for, and I do, recognize some of the different issues that we're facing in terms of um, the um, uh, question for what are the rules in terms of are they open or are they closed and then what do you do in terms of enforcement um, I do think that um, um, that the um, the signage that the belt line is done both from those the initial signs that you put out there that were creative 
and attention getting. We're out there before anybody else's were out there. And then when that, it was seen that those weren't proving to be as um, effective in changing behavior, the escalation of the, the red stop signs and the orange signs have continued, I think, to ratchet up. And um, I do think that, that those have been helpful in trying to move things in the right direction, but I recognize there's still room for improvement. Um, so I think the message that I can share on this call right now is as a nonprofit that supports parks, we're uh, really trying to encourage people to err on the side of caution, uh, but also this is a, a kind of a big, and I've heard it referred to as a big virtual experiment on behavioral change. And I think that the main point is not to disengage. So uh, Brian Borden shared that they have gone through steps in Brookhaven to not only remove the basketball rims, but the um, nets and other types of things. And I think we need to be observant of what we're seeing in our community and relaying that back to our government partners and our elected officials, what we're seeing. Um, but part of this is not just a decree because Again, as we pointed out, the playgrounds are closed officially, uh, but there's still activity that's going on in those places. So we really need to look at how do we change behavior and recognizing right now we're not at a point where the Parks Department has um, ample or abundant staff to respond to those different types of things. Just the effort to get those thousand signs out there in short order in the different parks has been a major lift. And so I think that we need to continue to work on this and to share what we're seeing. And I will come back to the fact that after this call, if you're wondering, so what, what happens next? On Friday, we have a peer support call from 12 to one, where rather than hearing from our different speakers, we hear from our friends at the park groups and our conservancies, what they're hearing in their community. And from this call, we'll be relaying what we're hearing uh, back to our partners that aren't on this call at this time. So Michael, just one last comment and then uh, Kayla, you can mute me again. <laughs> um, Michael, I appreciate that comment about the Parks Department. I think everyone is doing the best that they can. And I think everybody is doing a great job, you know, and, and we certainly are learning how to do a better job. Um, mm -hmm. Beltline, as you said, has done an excellent job in terms of putting that signage out. And what I learned from uh, at least the Atlanta Memorial Playground was that because the, the paper sign was so small and there's only one that was put on the interior of the playground until we came out and actually put additional signage and caution tape around, people would not connect the dots because we were putting caution tape around as people were still playing on the playground. So to, mm. to, to use the outline as a model, at least for Commissioner Gargle, the sooner you get visible signage out, the better you have with people complying so of course right now no one's playing on the playground because it's it's known far and wide that playgrounds are closed but in the beginning with one paper sign it wasn't sufficient so that's just my only comment it's not a criticism um, if I, and i completely like empathize and agree with your comment great great thank you catherine and michael um so before we move to, I, I have four more questions, I think, on deck right now. But before we move to those, I want to let Brian give a little bit of related information from Brookhaven. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. And just to follow up on what uh, Michael was talking about, in Brookhaven, uh, we've put all the caution tape around. We've put the signs up. Um, and as he talked about, we removed the basketball courts. We had let we had put caution tape up on our outdoor basketball court at our Linwood Park Rec Center. And most of the people had started to really pay attention to what we were doing. Then one night we had a group, large group of kids that came out uh, and we had to call the police department out there to help break it up. And we asked them, you know, why did you cross the tape? Didn't you see the signs? And they were like, what signs? We, we thought this was a crime scene. And the officers were like, well, then you really shouldn't be here. Uh, so that's what let us go ahead and pull the rims down, remove all the volleyball nets. Uh, our citizens have been really good about uh, connecting through our Brookhaven Connect app of letting us know uh, if, if there are more than a certain number of people showing up at parks. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're, we're looking at, or we're gonna be putting out the signs tomorrow on social distancing uh, to remind them that, hey, if you're in our parks, it's great to be in the parks, but please remember to keep your six foot distance. Uh, mm -hmm. Our members are out in the parks every day. So we're able to go out and look and see what caution tape has been put da taken down or if it has, if it's not, uh, for the most part, our citizens have done a really good job of staying off the playground equipment. 
Uh, I've seen a couple of instances where uh, some has been pulled down. I don't know if it's just because of the weather or something else. Uh, we did have an individual that bent one of the uh, uh, gate latches on our dog park because he wanted to let his dog in, even though it, the, the gate was locked. So uh, we, we've had the, we've had our share of challenges as well, but uh, for the yeah. most part, the citizens have stepped in, uh, kind of been our eyes and ears after hours, and uh, they know that if there's an issue, they can reach out to the uh, police department, and the PD will come out and uh, make sure that the, the situation is handled appropriately. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, and that actually leads well into um, the next question. So I've got four questions on deck um, from David, Jerry, Rosa, and Jim. Um, so David asks, I, I assume about the city of Atlanta, has the city added more security or implemented fines or other measures to reduce gatherings and exposures in the parks? And I'm not personally aware of any um, kind of more um, advanced enforcement, um, but maybe Michael or Rob know something. And I don't I honestly know, and I'm curious with Rob on any of the different areas that they've had some of the um, larger concentrations of folks, whether or not enforcement has been something that has um, entered into the conversation. To my knowledge, I am not, not aware of um, um, added enforcement specifically towards um, enforcing social distance. Yeah, I, I have not heard any, um, I have not heard of anybody getting arrested or fined. Um, I, yeah, I, I haven't. And, and I think there's a lot of very critical stuff happening. I mean, they're, they're limited police resources and, and, and such as well. Got it. I guess we'll keep an eye on that. Um, and Jerry, you are raising your hand to ask a question. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. First, I wanted to thank Brian because I'm a resident of Brookhaven and I know how hard it is for him to be keeping control of all the parks here in the city. I have witnessed the ribbons ripped down and I've seen people playing tennis on the park near me and I know it's hard to police and more power to you for doing that. But um, I did want to just reach out to anybody that this goes back to what Rob was talking about earlier on the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, I'm with Bank of America and I actually helped Earthshare Georgia submit their application a couple of days ago. So I would be willing to help anyone with their submission if they want to reach out to me. If you're a small business or a nonprofit, I can help you. Of course, that, like Rob said, you have to be a customer of Bank of America to, to work through me. But um, if you are, you can reach me at jerry.travers at bofa.com. So I'm willing to help you out. That's great. All right. That's all I've got, Ellen. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Jerry. Um, and Rosa, you had a question. I think it's definitely worth asking. Um, so I would go ahead and pose it and we'll see if we can help you. Are you able to unmute yourself, Rosa? Yeah, I thought, okay. I'm can, okay, thank you. Um, hello, all. Um, thank you for taking my question. I've been getting a lot of calls from local restaurants about doing pop-up shops in the park, and I, I really don't feel comfortable. I imagine that's got to have some social distancing issues, but they want to see what the legislation is. I sent it to Adrian at the city, but I haven't heard back, and I'm sure she's swamped, and it's the last thing she wants to hear about. So um, I just don't know if you're getting the same request or not. And then the other thing that I was gonna say, um, we had we put out signs that say spread out, hashtag spread out, spread out with text to give underneath, and we've gotten some very modest gifts. So if you wanna see the signs, they're on our uh, Facebook page. Um, anyway, so back to the pop-up shops. I have three restaurants that are requesting that. So this is, um, I, I'll just uh, share one, and this doesn't directly answer the question, but I will share that I've been in conversations with Michelle Blackman over at the Grant Park Conservancy, and they've been struggling with what to do about the Grant Park Farmers Market because the Grant Park Farmers Market um, uh, was actually scheduled to come back to Grant Park. And I know that 
Michelle was uncomfortable with the fact that this not, is not just a place that people buy produce, that it's a social gathering spot. And I know that um, the uh, farmer's market has been um, actually um, in the off season um, is at Eventide Brewery um, over in Grant Park as kind of their fallback location when they're not at the park. And they continued to stay in that location. And someone, Katie Hayes from the Grant, from the Farmers Market Association, had shared that they actually decided that it was better to keep it at Eventide because people are less likely to stand around and socialize when they're in a parking lot versus a park. And they also implemented measures to keep their effort going with hand washing stations and figuring out ways where merchants were keeping their produce in their coolers and very extensive protocols in the way that they were handling their efforts. And that doesn't exactly answer the question as it relates to um, the, the park, but I know that um, uh, Michelle had many of the same concerns that you're um, voicing for the park specifically. And I didn't really hear a lot of receptivity from her or from folks in the park. Um, so I would really suggest that you suggest to the restaurateurs to really look at ways that you're not looking at an amenity location that people would want to gather and congregate, but if anything, looking more at the example of um, the Eventide Brewery example where um, restaurants are trying to figure out ways to have people come in and to transact business and then to leave and that the pop-up trucks and things along those lines are really focused on generating crowds and that that's not what we're trying to do here. So okay. that, that's my advice and it's not necessarily the, um, it gives them what they're looking for. But I think right now, if we're going to keep our parks open, it's going to be because it's, people aren't going there to hang out in concentrations. And I think something like that is actually gonna work against our goals here. Correct. Yeah, no. They just want the specific guidelines. And I'm, I was just like, this is common sense. There's no, you know. Right. So, anyway. Okay. I mean, I will, yep. I will say just, I mean, anecdotally over the, uh, I think it was over the weekend, uh, for those who know Nina and Rafi's pizza in, in SPX Alley, um, they took a lot of heat because they were still doing takeout. I mean, not, they weren't taking heat because they were doing takeout, but they were doing, they were taking heat because their outside seating area was open and people would come pick up the pizza and then all sit on the benches and you know and they and they just got right. um you know uh, taken to task and and the next the next day there's now caution tape around the seating area danger signs cones and they right they cut that off so that's not a, an official rule but there's the the public shaming I guess, <laughs> aspect of it. If, well, if you want an example of what somebody, you know, how the public had reacted to crowds congregating around food, I'm sure you can find it on online somewhere. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you I will also add that... Go ahead. I was just going to add that um, I have heard some people bringing up related to the Beltline conversation and others that the Streets Alive um, effort showed ways that roads can be closed and be opened up for public access in different ways so that we're again looking at ways of spreading out and using our space in more creative ways and again I think right now we're in triage mode uh, where we're trying to come up with what are the things that we can do to be most protective of public health um, and depending on the duration of how far this goes um, I do think there are some ideas for some creative uses and I mentioned that I've seen use of playground, or I'm sorry, uh, golf courses for walking um, and allowing that in a temporary basis as uh, a creative solution. And I, I mentioned uh, just now the idea that parking lots could be a place to transact business and get people moving on their way. But I've wondered if more focused road closures in different places might also provide ample places for people to walk and um, in some ways be part of a strategy that's making use of our uh, public spaces beyond the park in ways that uh, keep the kind of distance that we need in order for everyone to stay healthy. That is interesting, I had not thought about road closures. Um, so we had a question from Jim about path trails. Um, is the guidance for path trails the same as for Beltline? 
So, um, so again, the, the path trails fall under the uh, same rules as uh, whatever the local municipality has. So it, it's not a path, you know, path, path has hundreds of miles of trails throughout the state, right? So right. it's a little bit different than, than the Beltline where we're, the Beltline's fully contained within the city of Atlanta. And therefore, um, you know, if, if anything, I think there's probably more special rules for the Beltline than there is um, for, the, for the rest of the city because it is um, so, has been so heavily used. Um, I mean, we're all under a stay at home order, right? So I would say that applies to, to path trails. It, if I'm understanding the question, my guess is that they're looking at the recent guidance by Mayor Bottoms over time allocations and whether or not that applies to path. Yeah, I think that, I, as far as I know, those, that applies just Correct. to the line. The, the Freedom Trail, you mm -hmm. know, um, Silver Comet Trail, other, other trails are not under that same guideline. Right. Um, I, I will mention that, you know, all trails are not the same. And I think there's different ways that the East Side Trail has become this promenade in Atlanta that has higher densities of people uh, walking even in the best of times. And this uh, recent question reminded me of a posting I'd seen from Ryan Gravel, uh, the originator of the Beltline that put out, an, uh, and again, this was not a guidance, this was just one citizen, but saying need to get out and love the Atlanta Beltline, or need to get out and love the Atlanta Beltline, awesome. But hey, during this global, highly contagious pandemic, COVID-19, COVID Please create space by exploring other trails. Leave the Beltline for people who live on it and those who have to rely on it for transportation. Otherwise, it's going to have to close. And then he goes on to list a number of different trails that aren't the Beltline that don't see the same kinds of densities and things like that that allow us a chance for people to have a trail experience um, without adding additional congestion. And I think that's a good point to consider um, just as we think about the relationship between not just the, the, the Beltline and Path, but all the other trails that we have in our city and region. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, so that is all the questions that, as far as I can tell. Um, does anyone have additional questions that have not been asked? Let me see if I can. Yeah, I don't see anyone's hand raised. There are two hands oh. raised. It looks like um, Pauline and Catherine, and Catherine. again. Um, Pauline, what is your question? My question uh, actually pertains to something I think the first speaker mentioned. He indicated that during this period, I think in his city, they, they're taking this opportunity to do deep cleaning so my question is whether in Atlanta, deep cleaning is in the plans for this, this period, or if, if not, whether it, whether it could be on the list, deep cleaning for the rec centers. Mm. So um, I'll just, Number one mentioned that I saw Kayla had shared that we uh, will be keeping track of the Zoom group chat here and kind of making sense of what the issues that have come up on this call. And also that we will uh, carry uh, some of the different things that we've heard to the government partners that aren't on the call. Um, one area that this kind of um, connects for me is uh, that there are efforts to do a comprehensive parks and recreation plan for the city of Atlanta uh, Sabina Casamova, who, uh, wave your hand, Sabina, is our uh, public engagement specialist who works with Park Pride, but will be playing a role in helping to roll that out once we get beyond the immediate crisis at hand. And I've been doing a lot of thinking, thinking about that comprehensive master plan. We haven't had a master plan in the city of Atlanta for parks um, since uh, Project Green Space that was under, undertaken under uh, Mayor Shirley Franklin. And um, when we started this effort, uh, we were at a point where, um, for example, uh, around Westside Park, there was a moratorium on building permits and other different types of things that 
as we were anticipating what needed to be a part of that 10-year capital improvement plan, uh, we were anticipating a very hot real estate market and uh, boundless growth in the city of Atlanta. And I feel like COVID-19 has really um, reframed that whole conversation to look at access in parks uh, where people live, um, access to nature. And I think it's also raised a number of different um, health and safety guidelines regarding um, the cleanliness of facilities and what happens after we return back to not just our uh, the, the workplaces, our churches, uh, but also our parks, our recreation centers, our playgrounds. And so I do think that that will be a place um, that these issues um, need to be addressed. And I think that's one place that we can look. Um, I have not heard of a plan to look at kind of a deep cleaning regimen uh, towards our rec, rec centers. Um, um, and I do think that part of the question will be looking at the staffing and the resources that are needed to get beyond where we're at and figuring out what are the resources that are needed and how do we prioritize those needs. Uh, but as we've said, and really going back to the language that we, uh, I shared from the city, um, that really looking at the uh, foremost uh, per, um, uh, need is public health. And so I do think looking at those different elements as it relates to these facilities will be an important um, um, area to consider as we're looking at inviting people back to use these spaces. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, and Catherine, you had raised your hand, you had a response to Rosa's question. Thanks, Alan. Um, Rosa, just very quickly, um, getting back to your question, one of the things that I did when I had some of these uh, restaurant vendors who, you know, I think we all definitely want to support um, when they requested to come out to the park. I deferred them to the uh, civic association um, because I felt, to everyone's point, we didn't want people taking their food and congregating in the park. So that might be something that you want to do if you want to reach out to the Chastain Civic Association where they can use somebody's driveway instead of the park to do their food truck. Thank you. That's a good idea. This is a good idea. Um, does anyone else have questions? I'm looking for raised hands or anything in the chat. Um, and Kayla just did a message in the chat. If you have specific things that you'd like us to follow up with, um, with the Parks Department in the city of Atlanta, um, feel free to put it in the chat or um, you're welcome to reach out to a Park Pride staff member. Um, I shared the Friends of the Park email, which is just friends at parkpride.org, um, or you can send one of us a direct chat, um, but we, we are gonna try to collect that information and see if we can get some answers. Um, does anyone have final questions before we open it to just general announcements? All right, we'll continue to um, put stuff in the chat if you have anything. Um, and now we're just gonna open it for announcements. And I think at this point, um, you're welcome to just, if you're um, joining us online, um, to just verbally do that. You don't have to put it in the chat. Um, you can raise your hand so we can call on you. Um, so if you are on the phone, raising your hand again is star nine. Uh, if you are joining online or on the app, um, if you click on participants on your controls bar, um, you will see at the bottom of the participants window a raise hand button, and that is how you raise your hand. Uh, Rosa, you've raised your hand. Go for it. Come on. Um, yes, thank you. So we've been trying to provide online um, material for our for anybody really, but for our members and park users, and so they're pretty hooky, and you will hopefully laugh with me and not at me, but we've been doing online farm videos and they're on our YouTube channel. And it's through a partnership with the North Fulton Master Gardeners and they're teaching about victory gardens and tomato gardening and all this stuff. And so if you find yourself with some time and find it useful, I would love for you to check it out. So that's all. Great. 
Thank you, Rosa. Um, and how did you say we can find those again? We created a Chesapeake Park Conservancy YouTube channel. YouTube and channel. So, mm -hmm, we have a link on our website and on Facebook, but it, the easiest way is to just go to the Chesapeake Park Conservancy YouTube channel. And feedback would be awesome. If you think they're too short, too long, <laughs> or not useful at all, please love the feedback. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Rosa. Does anyone else have announcements for the group? Um, or if anyone's having trouble raising their hands or accessing the chat or anything like that, um, please let us know somehow so we can try to help you out. This is Michael. I, I will just um, reiterate that I can be reached at michael at parkpride.org. Um, and also, I shared before the Friends of the Park peer support call that we do on Fridays from 12 to 1. We've also had some conversations with folks from the Grows a Lot program and Foodwell Alliance about the possibility of a peer support uh, call for community gardeners. And so if there are community gardener groups that are involved with any of your parks who would be interested in that to get in touch with. Um, any of us at Park Pride, and we can provide the details for that peer support group as well. But as I mentioned, the calls that we've been doing with the Friends of the Park groups really give them a chance to share what they're seeing and hearing uh, locally. And uh, we really, um, I think we benefit from learning more uh, from, from what folks are hearing and seeing in their local neighborhoods and figuring out how we can um, um, react and respond to that kind of thing. So I would invite you to get involved with that or to share that with other folks you know who uh, might have missed this call, but would appreciate a chance to, to get connected with uh, Park Pride and all the different groups we work with. Yes, definitely. Um, and Catherine, you have your hand up. You can go ahead. Uh, Michael, this is just a, more of a follow up um, to you. Do you mind mentioning again? I did not have a uh, pen and uh, paper ready when you mentioned when you said this before, but uh, the article on supporter report, um, I thought yep. that that sounded like a great article to forward on. So if you could share that yep. with everyone again. So the article is entitled, Should You Be Visiting Your Local Park? And it's something that, that again, is under my byline and it's in the P People's Places Parks um, column that we have monthly on supporter report. Uh, the supporter report, so if you Google supporter report, you'll get them to their website and should be able to find that column. If you're on Facebook, we're, we've also posted it on Park Pride's website, or I'm sorry, on our, um, um, we've posted it on our uh, feed on, on Facebook, as well as other places, Twitter and that kind of thing. Um, so it provides kind of some, it also provides links to things like the CDC guidelines, uh, but it also just gives this kind of, how do we err on the side of caution? Uh, how do we focus on as you, go beyond your home to looking at going out to a park, focus on your local neighborhood park, as opposed to destination parks uh, where there might be greater concentrations of people. That's helpful, thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. So are there any other announcements or questions? I'm gonna take an awkwardly long pause to give people time to raise their hands or um, put something in the chat. Okay, Kayla, do you mind pulling our PowerPoint back up? Um, and if anything comes up in the next couple of minutes, um, we are flexible. So please do raise your hand or um, speak up or put something in the chat. Just give me one second. Okay, almost there. Awesome. Can you guys see that? I can see it. Hopefully everyone else can too. Um, so I can Mike, see it. Lovely, good. Um, and for those of you on the phone, I'm gonna go through what's on the screen. Um, and Michael has already mentioned it. So this is really a review. Um, but I just wanted to mention some upcoming Zoom meetings uh, for that all of you are welcome to attend. So we will continue 
uh, virtual park meetings monthly. Um, our May park meeting is Wednesday, May 13th from 6 to 7.30, so same time, um, same day of the week. Um, and we'll be talking about Nature for All and um, what that initiative is like, how you can get engaged with it, um, and just some creative and safer ways to kind of enjoy the benefits of nature during this time. Um, Michael also mentioned our weekly peer support calls for Friends of the Park, um, and those are open as well. We've had some non-Friends of the Park um, people join, and that's actually been awesome. So again, those are Fridays from 12 to 1, right in the lunch hour. Those are also on Zoom. Um, we will put, so all these things will be on the Park Pride online calendar. That's parkpride.org. Oh good, Kayla's putting this in the chat as well. Um, and so yes, please find that on our website. We will um, put things out as also in the um, Friends of the Park monthly emails. Um, and I think most of this, if not all of it, will also be on the Park Pride Facebook page. Um, so in addition to the peer support calls, Michael mentioned our community gardening listening session. Uh, we wanna kind of assess the needs of that particular group. Uh, that's co-hosted by Atlanta and Foodwell Alliance, and that will be next Wednesday, April 16th um, from 12 to 1. So again, at lunchtime on Zoom. And as I said, all of these things are on our online calendar. That's parkpride.org slash events. Ellen, right. just one note, the call for community gardens is next Thursday, not Wednesday. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Next Thursday. The date is right, though, the 16th. Yes. Next Thursday, April 16th. Thank you, Kayla. You're welcome. Um, do we have any final announcements or questions before we adjourn? I'm going to take an awkwardly long pause. All right. Well, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers, um, Brian, Rob, Michael. Thanks to all of our participants who joined us. Um, we hope you all stay safe. Um, please let us know if we can do anything for you. Again, Park Pride is here. We're working remote. So email and cell phone is the best way to reach us. Um, and if you don't have anyone's email, just go to friends at parkpride.org and Kayla and I will help you out. And all of our emails are on the um, Park Pride website too, if you go to our staff page. So thank you again. Yeah. We're officially adjourned. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, I always Bye. never know how to hang up. Oh, here we go. You went to leave. <laughs>